Hi, my name is Tiffany and I'm part of the education team at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I want to talk all about birds. Learning about birds is a great way to link us with the outdoors right in our own backyards or front yards, in our neighborhoods, our local parks, or our community open spaces. One of the biggest challenges of teaching bird identification and observation is getting the birds to hold still. So the birds themselves are always busy, right? They're always moving about. Rarely do they sit there long enough for you really to get a good long look at them or a photo of them uh, to work on identifying them. Um, so what I've done is I've found some resources that will help us uh, kind of narrow down our selections and go through some steps and that will help us get closer to um, identifying or becoming familiar with the things we're seeing in our own backyards. The following five topics are important in helping beginners identify birds. The first one is the size, then field marks, body outlines, color, and song. Song is a hard one. Song is one that um, more experienced birders um, are really good with. And it's kind of like, it's, a mu it's like a musician. Um, some musicians are able to hear the different notes in a song or identify a song based on um, certain chords that they hear. That's the way expert birders are. They've been doing it for so long, they can hear a particular bird song and without even seeing the bird, they can say, okay, I know this bird's in the area, and then they can begin looking for it. There are some birds that we have grown up with hearing in our communities, um, so we should be familiar with some of them. So I have some recordings. So I'm gonna show you an image of a bird and the, what, the sound it makes. So this one is a mockingbird. We oh, oh, see a lot of those in our yards. And the mockingbird uses the calls of other birds, but they generally tend to repeat things three times in a row. Um, so that's a good sign. If you hear a pattern of calls and it's repeated three times, three times, three times, um, that's a good indication it might be a mockingbird. Um, another one we see um, that's pretty distinct. Let's see. is a morning dove. Those I hear early in the morning, especially in the springtime, and oftentimes I'll hear them in the evenings too, right before sunset. Um, what else do we have? Uh, these were my little house wrens, um, house finches, house wrens, these little guys. Woodpeckers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And these, how about these little guys? Little nut hatch. And how about a black cap chickadee? Now let's talk about the body outlines. In considering shape, there are four subcategories you wanna look at. You wanna look at the head, the beak, the tail, and the overall body shape. So the head, um, some birds have little crests on top, like the cardinal. So when you're looking at the head, you can think, does it have a crest on top like a cardinal? Um, is it a big round head? like a kestrel. Uh, the beak, what is the beak shape and size, right? Is it really pointy like a woodpecker's beak? Is it um, hooked like an owl's beak? We have two little small songbirds so when you see them, you might be trying to figure out which one's which, but then look at the beaks. They have two very distinct beaks. And um, that depends on what they're eating. If 
they're eating seeds, if they're eating worms. Um, so the beak can tell you a little bit about them. And then the other thing is the tails, right? Do they have a really long tail, like a mockingbird? Um, do they have a little short stubby tail? Do they have a square tail? Do they have a rounded tail? The tail will tell you some things about it as well. So size would be the next thing we look at. So when you're looking at birds, in order to kind of figure out what category you figure out, are they small, medium, or large? So you have birds that you compare them with. So a small bird would be like the size of a sparrow. Um, those are, uh, you know, five inches, but they're going to be moving so fast, you're not going to be able to measure them. But just know that things that are the size of a sparrow are small. If things are around the size of a robin, that's kind of a medium, so it's the size of a robin, or it's a little bit bigger, like the size of a crow. So that's uh, one way to classify them, right? Size of a, ro a sparrow, a robin, or a crow. Often in nature, when we see really colorful birds, we can assume that those are the males. The plumage or the coloring of the birds are parts of the strategies that birds have or the ways they're adapted for survival and for reproduction. So in the springtime, the males have all these bright colors, they use their song, they fluff up their feathers, they flash their colors, and that's how they attract the mates. Once they've coupled up and they've nested, the female has to actually sit on the nest and incubate those eggs. So she doesn't want all of these loud colors. She wants to blend in. She wants to blend in with her nest, her nesting material, and the area where she's nested. So she wants to blend. She wants to be more camouflaged with the environment. The other thing is, if she's sitting on the nest taking care of that, he's out and about. If a predator comes near the nest, something threatening comes near the nest, the male is going to use those showy colors to uh, sound an alarm and to create attention. He's like, look over here, look at me, look at me, look at me. And then that predator's attention is drawn towards him and he's going to bring them away from where the female is sitting there and she'll hold perfectly still and she'll blend in well. What are the aspects of these birds that you see that really stand out? because those will be what we know as field marks. The various markings that help beginner bird detectives learn about the different identities. If we were to think of, for example, bald eagle, right? You think of the white head and the tail. Those features in the eagle's large size are the most prominent field marks. A white-throated sparrow has a white patch under its chin, or the tail of the mockingbird is very long. So as you get more involved with identifying birds, you can look to see if there's a stripe below the eye or is uh, the breast plain or spotted or streaked. When the bird flies, are there markings on the tail or the wings? All these questions will help you start to identify the birds a little more easily. Binoculars are a great tool to help us observe and identify birds. This is a pair I got from my dad, but I know not everybody has a pair of binoculars at home, but I know that everybody has a bunch of these laying around. So you can take your empty toilet paper rolls or your empty paper towel rolls. And these ones I just put together with two rubber bands and a little bit of ribbon. And I'm ready to go. I took this paper towel roll, I put it in barbecue tongs so I'm able to rest that to hold it steady, and then I can look around and check things out. Okay, so now we're ready to get out there and start practicing. You've got your binoculars or your spotting scope, and we've got some of our bird silhouettes out there. And as I'm looking at this scene, I can spot a blue jay. I spot a nut hatch on the trunk of the tree, a little tulip poplar there. On the ground, I see a mockingbird and a morning dove. 
Now, if I were recording this, it would be a little bit tricky to try to describe where I'm seeing them. So, a lot of times birders will use a clock analogy when they're um, recording their observations about where they're seeing things. So, think about a clock. What? And think about where the numbers on a clock are. So, it's going to be much easier for us to say, the blue jay, I notice a blue jay at 12 o'clock. At six o'clock, I've got a mockingbird and a morning dove. And about three o'clock is a nuthatch. So I started out uh, doing my field observations with a bird I was familiar with. So I was using cardinals and I was using blue jays, ones that I could easily identify. And I was going through practicing, going through writing down about the size in relation to a sparrow, a robin, or a crow. I was figuring out a little bit about the outline, uh, writing down any notables in the field marks, you know, striped tail, long tail, crested head, bright colors. Um, and then I was writing down any observations. So that's a good way to practice. If I came across a bird that I wasn't as familiar with, I could gather this information and then I can use uh, any one of a number of resources that are out there. There are free apps that are bird identification apps. I know iNaturalist has a free app that you can use. You put in as much information as you can and then it gives you back a list of possible, what it could possibly be. And then you look at those and usually you're able to narrow it down and get a positive identification. Um, Merlin Birds is also a free app that you can download that deals all with birds and it breaks it down into where you're seeing them. Once you start to create a list of the different birds that are in your community or once you get familiar with the birds that are in your community, you can start to research other topics as well and start to learn more about maybe the relationship between cats and birds in your in communities. Um, you could add a bird bath or a bird feeder and you can collect data and observations from that. You could put out puffs of your dog's hair when you're brushing your dog or tiny pieces of yard so you can observe some different nest building. Or you can look at maps and look at flyaways and migration patterns. So in your backyards or front yards, um, any time of day is uh, good to see some activity, but the best times where you're going to see the most activity or the most birds or make the most observations, uh, best times are early morning before the sun comes up or right as the sun's coming up. That's, that's when they're going to be pretty active. Sometimes in the evenings around dusk is good. And if you get out right after we have uh, rain showers, everybody's out, Every, all the birds are out because the, the rain is moving around, the worms are coming out of the ground or insects are moving around or there's puddles for them to take baths. So there's always a lot of action after a rain event. If you end up doing some backyard birding, Please feel free to share your stories, photos, or experiences with us on our social media pages. And if you want to learn more, go to Chesapeake Bay Foundation at cbf.org.